Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. If you've ever wandered through the woods and wondered about a track that you saw or markings on the ground that you couldn't explain, then you'll be interested in meeting today's guest. He's a wildlife tracking expert. He draws on his experience and expertise to teach a wide variety of classes, including wildlife tracking courses with UVM's continuing education program. I want to welcome back Mike Kessler. Mike was with us for a bit last fall for an introduction on wildlife tracking. So welcome back. Thank maybe, you, Jean. Maybe you can explain to our viewers what we're going to be focusing on today. Sure. Today we're going to be actually um, digging for tracks in a sense. We're going to be looking at the earth and where it suggests the tracks may be hidden and in an archaeological sense we're going to be picking apart the substrate to look for those hidden treasures of oh. um, really perfect tracks. Okay well you recently worked with the Cross Offenses Rebecca Gollin to create a series of images that kind of highlight this and show people what you're talking about. Yes yeah, so if we can take a look at these images rather quickly it'll demonstrate um, the sequence which is this is an up close shot of an arrangement of pine needles that first suggested to me a bobcat track in the middle and it's outlined there by its compression followed by the four holes I see which are the toes and the heel pad of a bobcat turning left. The surprising thing was, and this is from Oregon, where my colleague Joe Cruzman is, he took this picture of a mountain lion track. And here you can see, this is how we train our eyes to see those hollow spots and arrangement of the needles. So again, this was not in Vermont, that was from Oregon, where Joe is. Mm -hmm. so. And so, obviously when you're out in the woods, the tracks aren't highlighted like that. Um, so now we're going to join uh, Mike in the woods as he tries to prove a tracking hypothesis about one of Vermont's wild cats. Normally the bobcat is one of the most elusive, evasive, quietest, and mysterious creatures in the woods. I'm here in the Jericho Research Forest. The little treasure that was found here was a turkey carcass this spring. A turkey was killed, pushed up against this root mass, and then covered, mounded over by an animal clawing and scraping and kicking all the debris on the forest floor on top of the animal. And the animal most known to exhibit that behavior is the bobcat. So looking at the ground when that was found, sure enough there were uh, some great bobcat prints and uh, what happened was about a week later the bobcat had come back, opened up its cache and then ate it in, well took the carcass and in three different locations uh, began to consume its meal. They're very conscious of their movement and so normally their tracks are very difficult to find. However, when it's exerting a lot of force to bury something, dig something up, hold something with one paw, tear at it, etc., um, it's making it extra effort and exerting extra force on the ground. So those locations are actually pretty good uh, locations to find tracks. Here we have where the bobcat was standing and the four most pronounced tracks are this one right here, call this a compression, and there was a lot of turning which swirled up these pine needles like this where they're sticking up, not laid down. Here's this one, so this will be the left rear. Here's the right rear, same thing again. Right side, swirling, pushing off, digging in a lot with the right because it's countering the left where the body's turned a little bit. Oh boy, this is looking really nice here. There's that deep, deep toe and nail hole right there. Okay, what comes without resistance, I'll take. What wants to stay, I allow it to stay. And this one is a bit deformed to the left because of that rotation, because it's been chewing on these bones right here. Started chewing here, and is now chewing here and here. And so we've got that repeated head motion here, and the body, and all that force right here. So let's go a little deeper, but there's our nice, I'm looking straight down into a nice heel indentation here. So I'm going to actually go, oh, look at this. This is a beauty right here. These are the leaves from two years ago that have decomposed and the toe punctured it. And I can see clearly straight down the toe hole right through there, right in there. Some of these things are only evident the moment you begin to pull away and then as I complete the motion it's going to destroy it because it's very fragile down here but there it is. And now while the overall track might be more difficult to see as we go deeper we're still staying, staying with those two toes. Oh and right there, right there is the nail hole coming off. I can feel it so clearly with my fingertip. 
There's the nail hole coming off that, that deepest toe cavity. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. And, and I also see that way down in the compost, where everything else has turned to peat, are needles from above. So that can only happen if something sharp and narrow drove those needles from above way down into this compost below. So that's uh, as far as we go on this track and this digit. So we went from a kill site to a set of tracks, to a single track, to a toe, to a nail on the toe. And everything is correlating and lining up um, with our hypothesis that this being a, a bobcat eating a turkey right here in the manner in which it was doing it. So that's the joy of tracking right there. That's unbelievable. <laughs> now, how do you know that it wasn't just a neighborhood dog? Well, there's a couple of basic reasons between dog and cat family. <clears throat> the main one is the geometry of their feet. Cat feet are mostly round and dogs are oval, which, form, which has an influence on the shapes in the ground. But the biggest one for me is just the difference in between the proportion of the heel pad to the toes. So mm -hmm. it's a lot like we, we know the difference between our hands and our feet. And if you look at tracks long enough, you start to see the difference between dog and cat as dramatic as that, as, as, as we do with our hands and our feet. Well, of course, there are a lot of different types of cats across the country. And you had a chance to do some work in Oregon? Yes, with a colleague of mine, um, Joe Cruzman, who runs an, <coughs> excuse me, an outdoor program called Coyote Trails. And he and I are collaborating to form a new, um, new course offering this spring. So he's been out tracking big cats, the uh, mountain lions in Oregon, and has provided us some, uh, some information about them. Let's jo join Joe on a tracking expedition in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. Hello, I'm Joe Cruzman, and uh, we're in the southern Oregon Cascades right now and just found a really fresh uh, cougar track and an old trail that we're going to follow out and see where it leads us. This track right here is a nice track. You got toes and a really good tri-lobed heel pad. And uh, we're going to follow this up a little bit and see where it leads us. The way the mountain lions move is they don't like main trails. And they don't even really travel on deer trails here in the Southern Cascades. They'll travel just about 10 to 12 feet off from a deer trail. So as they move, they'll do a lot of direct register, just like your house cat will do. So that's where the back foot comes right into the front foot. I'm just gonna move along through here, this little corridor, just as the mountain lion would be moving. Right through here we've got a lot of sugar pine and ponderosa pine. And we've got one good compression of a cougar right here. And another nice one right up here. So you know it's a cougar in many different ways. One is the way the pine needles are organized, the compression shape. So when we don't look just at the track, we look around the track, we see the overall compression shape. This has a really well-defined heel pad right here. And then you've got your four toes. So the toes are in an arching pattern. And your heel pad, remember we talked earlier about that tri-lobed heel pad. So right here is a great track. And as this cougar came through here, kicked these needles up. And just meanders right along the shadow over here. So right up here we've got kill site. It's late June right now and this is an early spring kill and this track back here looked like a very young male coming back through here. There's really nothing left here, not even any hide. Mountain lions here in this area, they'll take a black-tailed deer about one every ten days or so and once they have their fill they'll cover it up so this isn't a very fresh kill. However, uh, it looks like a black bear has either been in here um, chewing on this and the coyotes will as well come in and help pick up from what the cougar doesn't. 
They're so elusive and so secretive, they very rarely leave sign. To find a kill site is really an amazing gift to be able to come across that, even though it was older. Well, thanks to Joe Cruzman for sharing his video. And if you're just joining us, I'm visiting with wildlife tracking expert Mike Kessler, who is an instructor with UVM Continuing Education. And I guess the bottom line is the tracks don't always look the same. No, they don't. And they rarely look like the pictures in the books. The tracks are basically another voice of the animal. And just like our voices, um, they can vary tremendously depending on circumstances that we're in. And so why track? Isn't that kind of old technology? Well, um, not really. It, it is old. It's, it's one of our oldest technologies, but um, the course we have this spring will be bringing students to Belize where they'll be working with wildlife biologists who are using modern techniques, radio telemetry, in addition to um, tracking to um, study the habits of a jaguar. Mm -hmm. And so tell me a little bit more about that course. This is a hybrid course which um, is offered in the spring semester. It has an online um, introductory piece to introduce students to tracking and then over spring break they'll be traveling to Belize for eight days to um, visit um, a wildlife sanctuary, interact with biologists and also um, go to a Mayan archaeological site. That's exciting. Yeah. Is that course open to anyone? <laughs> yes it is. It's through continuing education so it is open to the general public like all their other offerings. Now you've tracked a lot of cats in your day. Have you ever seen any catamount tracks in Vermont? Uh, trick question. <laughs> um, who can say for sure? You know, um, they all vary depending on size, and um, that's just something that um, I don't know. Trackers, until it's really confirmed by um, the biologists, mm -hmm. that's something that's just between trackers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me a little bit too about this, the science with tracking because there's a lot more that you can do with it besides just tracking animals. Um, yes, there is. Um, there's a forensic side to to tracking. Um, of course, as a pure recreational side, it helps um, not only with um, hunting, but also nature observation, mm -hmm. and just having a better understanding of what's happening in our ecosystems, especially at night, which is when we're not there, but when, quote, everything else is mostly going on. Mm -hmm. So um, I did want to mention, too, that um, in addition to our course, there are, UVM has a broad array of um, study abroad mm -hmm. programs. So um, there's a number of opportunities for students to, uh, to travel and to um, get out into the, um, into the wild. Why do you think it's important for students who are interested in maybe tracking to track in other places besides just Vermont? Well, each place is, has a different substrate. So it's almost like a different dialect. You can go around the country and it can be hard to understand people where their accents are very thick if you haven't, haven't um, tuned your ears or to different countries for that matter. And, uh, same is true with substrates, whether it be desert, uh, jungle, swamp, um, forest. Uh, it takes uh, not only that, uh, the substrate, but the animals. Mm -hmm. So everything, everything changes. Principles are, are the same, but uh, the uh, circumstances are what make it interesting. If somebody wants to get started learning about tracking, what should they do? Well, um, the best way is to look at the ground get a couple of guides, mm -hmm. um, a couple of courses are good. If you know somebody who has spent some time out, outside, um, start slow or just watch yourself or your family pet as they walk through the woods. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. You oh, that's that? one of the best. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'll have to pay more attention yeah. to when we're yeah. out. Yeah, you get real-time feedback because you, you see the animal making the track, so you know it's not often you get to see the animal in the track. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, for more so. information about the wildlife tracking course in Belize, you can visit the website learn.uvm.edu slash study abroad, or you can call the toll-free number at Continuing Education. That's 1-800-639-3210. Well, that's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. For a video copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-ATF-3430. Across the Fence is brought to you as a public service by University of Vermont Extension and WCAX-TV.